نحمده و نصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي ربنا زدنا علما الحمد لله with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessing upon us we have approached yet another ramadan which is just a few days away from us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to really reach that month and reap its benefits because this month this part of the year is so unique that there is no other time of the year which is similar to it it brings so many benefits and so many blessings which a person cannot find at any other time of the year when a person fasts in this month when a person stands in prayer at night in this month then all of his previous sins are forgiven imagine his entire slate is wiped off it is clean it is cleared up all his previous sins are forgiven this month is a month of mercy It's a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, His blessings are visible, are clear to us, are felt by us, are experienced by us every day and every night. Therefore, it is very important that as we approach this month, we are ready for it. We are mentally ready for it, we are spiritually ready for it, so that we can reap its benefits. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His doors are open. He sends down His rain. He showers us with His blessings. But every person does not take the exact same advantage from it. Each person takes from this blessing, from this rahmah, according to his capacity. Just as when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down rain from the sky, then every part of the earth, every part of land, does not benefit from it equally. There are certain parts which benefit from it so much that you can see the soil, it becomes soft. It becomes more fertile. The soil that was apparently dead because it was ready to receive that water, that rain, you see that it's covered with foliage. It's covered with flowers that are blooming, blossoming, fragrant and radiant in their color. But yet at the same time, that same rainwater will fall elsewhere, but there will be no effect of that water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives Ramadan to all people who are alive on the earth at that time. But everyone does not take the same advantage from it. There are those who find this month, and by the end of it, they have earned Allah's forgiveness. And there are others who, who find this month, but by the end of it, they haven't received the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their sins are the same. In fact, they have increased. Why? Because they did not understand the value of this month. They did not benefit from it. In Surah Yusuf, we learn about how Yusuf a.s. when he was thrown in the well by his brothers, and the caravan came, and they found this boy in the well, and they took him out. They just hid him, they concealed him as a commodity, and they sold him for just a few dirhams. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them, that وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ They were of those who had no interest in Yusuf alayhi salam. They had no interest. They could care less about him. Little did they know that this boy was one day going to become a prophet of Allah. One day he was going to be the minister of Egypt. If they knew his value, they would not have sold him just for a few dirham. They would have given more importance to him. They would have given more value to him. So we see that in order to reap, in order to take maximum advantage of any opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends our way, first and foremost, what is necessary for us is knowledge and awareness. Knowledge and awareness. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person knowledge and awareness of an opportunity, then he can take a lot of advantage from it. But besides knowledge and awareness, another very important thing is preparation. 
pre-preparation and planning from before. Because each person receives the same amount of time every single day. 24 hours. But there are some people who manage to get a lot done in those 24 hours and there are others who just waste that whole day. The difference lies in planning. You may have experienced this yourself also. The days that you are working, you get up on time. You get to do your work also. You come home and do your laundry even. You even cook a lot. But on weekends, what happens? We get up late, we take it easy. And by the end of the day, when you ask yourself, so what did I get done today? You realize that you hardly got anything done. What was the difference? The planning. For certain days, we have our entire day planned out. And for other days, we don't have planning done at all. If you've planned your trip to the mall, within an hour you can accomplish a lot. And if you haven't planned it, then you'll enter one door and you'll be going from one part to the other, looking for things to do. And by the time you've realized where you are, you find out that you've got barely half an hour left. So in order to take advantage, two things are important. Knowledge and awareness. And secondly, planning. And this is the reason why, alhamdulillah, we have gathered today to remind ourselves of the importance of this month, the virtues of this month, the opportunities that this month brings us so that we can take the maximum benefit from it. And also so that we can prepare ourselves mentally and otherwise also so that we can take the maximum advantage from this month. Now with regards to the month of Ramadan, we learn from a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا كَانَ رَمَضَانُ فُتِّحَتْ أَوَّابُ الرَّحْمَةِ That when the month of Ramadan comes in, then the gates of mercy are opened up. فُتِّحَتْ They are opened up wide. Allah's mercy is in profusion, is everywhere. Everyone is welcome to come and take a share of it. And everyone is welcome to come and take as much as they want from it because the gates of mercy are open. In another hadith, we learned that when the month of Ramadan begins, then a caller calls out, Yunadi Munadin, Ya Baghi al Khairi Akbil. A caller calls out that, O oh, seeker of good, come forward, rush. Anyone who wants good, speed up, come forward, come and take your share, hurry. Don't delay, don't wait. Keep going and keep reaping, keep collecting for yourself. Ya baghi al khairi aqbil. Wa ya baghi al sharri aqsir. And O oh, seeker of evil, stop. O oh, seeker of evil, stop. Yes, you have been doing a lot of wrong things before, but now the month of mercy has come. The month of blessings has come. So stop. So we see that in the month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's special help is there. For those who want to do good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help is there for those who want to keep away from sin. Because the doors of Jannah are opened and the doors of hellfire are closed. The doors of Jannah are opened, meaning the ways that lead to paradise, they're public, they're everywhere. So many opportunities to do good in order to make it to paradise. And the doors of hellfire are closed, they're shut. Meaning, there's the opportunity to sin is reduced. And we experience this in the month of Ramadan. That because there's an atmosphere of worship, of reciting the Qur'an, of qiyam, of standing in prayer, then what happens is that it becomes easy for us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On regular days, it might be difficult for us to you know, do some dhikr in the morning, read our morning adhkar or read our evening adhkar, to sit you know, with our hands out and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It might be difficult for us, or we don't even remember. We know that we're supposed to, and we perhaps even intend to. But we're so frazzled with all the things that are going on, that we don't get the opportunity. But alhamdulillah, in the month of Ramadan, everyone around us seems to be encouraged to do more good. And that is a motivation for us also. So doing good is facilitated for those who want to do good in the month of Ramadan. And committing sin is made difficult for those who want to abstain. And also the shayateen are locked up. Shayateen are locked up. So that again, the ways of goodness are made easy and the ways of sinning are made difficult. And remember that a lesson until 
Allah's tawfiq is there for a servant. Meaning unless and until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the ability and the opportunity to a servant to do something good, no one can do good. But Allah gives tawfiq only to those who strive. Only to those who put in effort. So really, at the end, it's up to us. How much is it that we strive to benefit from this part of the year? To earn forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make our home in Jannah. And to earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings. So in order to take advantage of this time, one of the first things that we need to do is do some pre-planning. Before the month actually begins, do some planning. And part of that is mentally preparing ourselves as well as our family members. Now alhamdulillah, we have come here together today. And inshallah, we will remind one another about the virtues of this month, about the different things that we can do in this month. But our families at home, what about them? What about our husbands, our children, our siblings? Make sure that as you prepare yourself, prepare your family also. Share with them at least one or two things so they're also motivated to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more. Because you see, worshiping Allah alone by yourself is very, very difficult. But when you have people with you, if your husband also sits after Fajr and opens up the Qur'an, how likely is it that you're going to go to bed? You'll also be motivated to sit and open up your Qur'an and do some recitation. If after Salah, your son or your daughter or your sibling sits down and does her adhka, then you are also more likely to do your adhka. So it is necessary that as we prepare ourselves, also prepare our family members. And alhamdulillah, there's so many lectures out there, there's so much material out there that we can revisit, we can listen to, we can read as a family in order to remind ourselves of the benefits of this month. Also, in order to make fasting easier and in order to focus on ibadah, one more important thing that we must do is get all the important you know, tasks out of our way. So for example, if you have your major Costco trip to do, don't wait for the first day of Ramadan. Do it now. If you have your Eid shopping to do, do it now. Don't wait for Monday to go for groceries. Go over the weekend. Go before Ramadan actually begins. So that you're not you know, extremely tired right at the beginning of the month of Ramadan. Get these things out of the way. Make sure that your house is clean. Things are you know, put in place so that during the month you're doing just the bare minimum in order to get by so that your fasting can be good and your ibadah can also be enjoyed. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ramadan has come to you, a blessed month. Allah has made obligatory upon you its fasting. In it, the gates of heaven are open and the gates of hellfire are closed and the evil devils are chained up. To Allah belongs a night in it, which is better than a thousand months. Whosoever is prevented from its goodness, then he has been deprived. If a person does not take advantage from the special night of this month, then he is deprived. And a person cannot take advantage of the special night of this month, unless he has taken advantage of every day of this month, every night of this month. What we learn from this hadith is that the month of Ramadan is primarily the month of fasting. And we all are aware of that. Ramadan means fasting for us. That is something that we are preparing ourselves for, especially uh, you know, for this year, we're mentally preparing ourselves that yes, the fasts are going to be long. Yes, the days are long. We're going to be tired. The nights are going to be short. The raweeh is going to be very late. But we keep telling ourselves, inshallah you'll do it. Inshallah you'll be able to do it. Don't think about it right now. When it comes, then we'll deal with it. It's okay, you survived last year. Hopefully you'll survive this year also. Right? Inshallah. But what will make fasting easy for us, inshallah this year, is if we remember the rewards of fasting. Yes, fasting is an obligation. It is something that we don't really have a choice about. We don't have a choice about that. We have to fast. It's something that is pumped upon every able believer, every able person. He has to do it. So when you have to do it, you might as well do it with good feeling. You might as well do it with a good heart. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan, how? With iman and with ihtisab. With faith. Faith in Allah. Faith in the fact that yes, fasting is an obligation. Not as a habit. 
Because for many people, fasting in the month of Ramadan is a habit. That every year when the season of fast comes, then yes, that's what we do. We fast. That's what we Muslims do. But why do we do it? We're doing it because we're believers. We believe in Allah. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it mandatory for us to fast in this month. And your doctor may warn you, or somebody might discourage you, or your friends or your co-workers might be shocked at the fact that you won't be eating or drinking at all during the entire day. But if you remember that I am doing this because my Lord has told me, He has commanded me, imanan. And secondly, ihtisaban. Ihtisab is to hope for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to expect reward from Allah. Then his sins will be forgiven. What does it mean by this? Hoping from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for reward. You see, there are many things that we do as Muslims. We pray, we give charity, we uh, you know do wudu, uh, we read the Quran, and we eat with our right hand, we say bismillah, right? After we eat, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're very good habits. And for a Muslim, whatever he does as a believer, inshallah, he's rewarded for that. But remember that the more you hope for reward from Allah, inshallah, the more rewarding that deed will be. The more rewarding that deed will be. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am as my servant thinks I am. So if you hope for reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Ya Allah, I know these fasts are very long and I'm already very scared. I get so thirsty. I don't know how I'm going to survive. I have to eat something every two hours, even now. What am I going to do in the month of Ramadan? Remind yourself, I'm doing it to seek Allah's reward. And tell yourself, and speak to yourself, and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it gets difficult. Ya Allah, only for you. I won't do this for anybody. I won't do it for myself. I won't do it for you know, some kind of blood work. I won't do it for anything. I will do this only for you, Allah, because I want reward from you. Ihtisaban. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ, once he was asked by a companion, that, O oh Prophet ﷺ, tell me about a deed that will allow me to enter Jannah. Tell me about something that I can do, which if I do, I know that inshallah I'll make it to Jannah. There's so many things that we've been told about. And some things we find difficult, some things we find easy, some things we do already, and some things we don't even know about. So this man, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, please tell me one thing that I can do, and it will help me enter Jannah. Would you like to know? Would you like to know about something that you can do so that inshallah you can go to Jannah? So the Prophet ﷺ told him, عَلَيْكَ بِالصَّوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لَا مِثْلَ On you is fasting. Meaning you must fast. Fast as much as you can because there is nothing like it. There is nothing like it. No good deed that is like fasting. Because you see, any other good deed that you do, what happens? It takes maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes, maybe half an hour. Okay, even if you go to volunteer somewhere, half a day, maybe two hours. But fasting is from when to when. The whole day basically. Even if you go for hajj, how many days is it that you have to spend in doing hajj? Not many. Not many at all. But think about it. Ramadan fasting, 29 or 30 days in a row. It's quite long. So really there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. In another hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that indeed there is a gate of paradise called Ar-Rayyan. Ar-Rayyan. And it will be called on the day of judgment, where are the ones who fast? Where are those people who used to fast? So whoever is among the fasting ones will enter Jannah through Ar-Rayyan. And the one who enters Jannah, he will never be thirsty. So in this Ramadan, during fasting, as we experience thirst, especially when you're reciting your Qur'an, and your mouth is dry, really dry, or you're outside walking in in the heat of the sun, and your mouth is dry, and you want to take just one sip of water, remind yourself of this. If I fast for the sake of Allah, inshallah, 
Allah will make me so satisfied that I will never ever experience any thirst. There is a scholar in his book, Fiqh al he writes that Ad-Dunya Darul Hajat Wal Jannatu Darul Shahawat. He writes that this world, this dunya, is a place of fulfilling your needs. Just the basics. You know, you just fulfill them because you gotta do them, otherwise, you won't survive. But Jannah is the home of desires. You want to have fun? You want to fulfill your desires? Save it for later. Because in this dunya, really, if you want to drink something, how much can you drink? Somebody gives you a big, huge cup of coffee even, which is your favorite, let's say, after half a cup, how much can you enjoy? You know, those first few sips, yes, you really enjoy them, but after some time, you just get so used to it. If you get a nice, cool drink when you're thirsty... Like for example, you know, you get a slushy or something. The first few sips, really good. But then after a couple of sips, what happens? You start getting brain freezes. Right? The, the flavor is overwhelming in your mouth. You don't enjoy it anymore. You start having a water bottle, you have a few sips and then you leave it. Which is why after every event, what happens? You find dozens of water bottles that are half empty, half full. Why? Because you enjoy it a little bit here, but then after some time, the enjoyment dies out. So when we're fasting, we're abstaining from eating and drinking in our desires for the sake of Allah, so that in the hereafter, He will fulfill our desires. He will admit us in a place where pleasure never ends, where enjoyment never ever ends, where you will never get tired. You can never get tired having fun even in Jannah. But the people who fast will be called from the gate of al rayyan in another hadith, we learn about the reward of fasting. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كُلُّ عَمَلِ ابْنِ آدَمَ لَهُ إِلَّا الصِّيَامِ هُوَ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِي Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Every good deed of the son of Adam is for him, except for fasting. Every good deed of the son of Adam is for him, except for fasting. That is for me. That is for me, and I shall reward the fasting person for it. Meaning that fasting is such a deed that is a secret between the servant and his Lord. You see, when you're praying salah, when you're doing wudu, a person watches you. Can they say to someone, yes, she prayed salah? Can they say that? Can they guarantee that, yes, you prayed salah, you did wudu? Yeah, because they saw you, right? But if you tell somebody I'm fasting, can they really guarantee that you're fasting? Because you can abstain from eating and drinking in front of them, but the moment they leave, you could shut the door, get yourself a glass of water, and enjoy. Who knows whether you are really fasting or not? Who knows? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah. No one knows you're really fasting except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why fasting is a deed that is sincerely, exclusively for who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why He will reward the person for it. What is that reward? We don't know. For many good deeds, we have been told what that reward will be. Seven times more, ten times more, seven hundred times more. But for fasting, what is the reward? We really don't know. And when is it that a person will find out what the reward is? When he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah will tell him the reward. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him the reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this deed so much. When a person is hungry, when a person is thirsty, for his sake he's abstaining from food, from drink, from his basic needs, only to make Allah happy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this so much. In a hadith, we learned that when a person has bad breath because of fasting, not because his mouth is dirty, but because his stomach is empty, then that smell is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the fragrance of musk. Even more than the fragrance of musk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves every deed of the fasting person, what he does in the state of fasting. In another hadith, we also learned that fasting is a shield 
It is a screen. It is a junna. Meaning, fasting is something that will protect a person from hellfire. It will protect a person from punishment in the grave. It will protect a person from falling down from the bridge when he's crossing it. It is a shield. It is a source of his protection. Because he is sacrificing his food and drink for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learned that when a person will be placed in his grave, just think of yourself. When a person will be placed in his grave, all alone, in that darkness, no friend is there, no mother is there, no phone is there, nothing's there, no light is there. He's all alone in that grave. And what is with him basically? His deeds and the consequences of his deeds. Then for his sins, the punishment that he deserves, it will approach him from the side of his feet. It will approach him from, the, from his right side, from his left side, from the side of his head. But for some people, a shield will come in between and protect that person. And what is that shield? His good deeds. So for example, from the right side, if the punishment is approaching him, his good deeds will become like a shield. You can't come this way. There's no way for you. The punishment will be removed away from him. And recitation of the Qur'an is one of those deeds that will protect a person from punishment of the grave. Salah is one of those deeds. Sadaqah is one of those deeds. And fasting is also one of those deeds. as Junna. Fasting is a shield. And you know, especially in this month of Ramadan, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to see it. If you're feeling really tired and really thirsty, and sometimes, you know, our nafs also, it makes us think negatively about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you might wonder, why do we have to fast? And why is it so difficult? Why isn't our religion so easy? Remind yourself, I'm just going to strive right now, I'm suffering right now, so that I can be protected later. I'm sacrificing right now, so that I can be saved later. Now when it comes to fasting, it begins with a suhoor and it ends with iftar. It begins with suhoor, with the pre-dawn meal that we eat. And it ends with iftar, which is after sunset, then we break our fast. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ said that three things are from the traits of prophethood. Meaning there were three things that every prophet did. They're from the akhlaq of nubuwa. And what are those? To hasten in iftar. Meaning, as soon as the time enters to break the fast, break the fast immediately. To delay the suhoor. This doesn't mean that you delay it like with an hour or something, no. Meaning, you eat suhoor as late as possible. As late as possible. And to place the right hand on top of the left hand in salah. So these three things the prophets did. This is from the ways of the prophets of Allah. So we see that eating suhoor and breaking your fast as early as possible, meaning immediately, this is actually something that we must pay attention to. Because unfortunately for some people, what happens is that they want to get their sleep. So they will eat in the night and then they will just sleep. And they won't care about getting up for suhoor. And they will just sleep through fajr even. And they'll get up at like 10, 11 or maybe even 12 o'clock because they are on their vacation. Right? And then they will get up and watch some TV and maybe you know, do something. Just basically they're killing time. Ramadan, when we're fasting, we're not supposed to be killing time. We're supposed to be taking advantage of every single moment. Because suhoor even, when a person gets up in order to eat suhoor, even in that is reward. Can you imagine we would be rewarded for eating at an odd hour of the night? Who would pay you for that? Which in a workplace would pay you for that? Reward you, pay you for eating. You get your lunch break, but that's also because it's your legal right. Right? But other than that, think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rewarding people for having their suhoor. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet sallallahu said, have the suhoor meal. Eat it. Eat the suhoor. Because in it is much blessing. فَإِنَّ فِي السُّحُورِ بَرَكَةً In it is blessing. And this is so true. Because in regular days, if you've just had your breakfast, and then you don't get to have your lunch, what happens to you by dinner time? You have a headache. 
you're extremely irritable, you feel like you're going to collapse. But what happens in the month of Ramadan? For 30 days in a row, you're surviving for the whole day based on what? Just one meal. One morning meal. Every morning. And that also very, very early morning. There is babaka in it. The Prophet ﷺ called it the blessed food. In a hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ said, this suhoor is a blessing that Allah has given to you, so do not leave it. It's a gift that Allah is giving you. Don't leave it. It's a gift, so take it happily. Likewise, he said, you should make morning meal compulsory upon yourselves. Meaning, make sure you have your suhoor. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ emphasized that even if it's just a sip of water that you can have, have it. Because sometimes it happens that we don't you know, wake up on time and we realize there's literally just a minute left or the adhan is going on on our alarm clock or something like that. And there's you know, a minute or something left. Then what should you do? Don't just go back to sleep. Get up. And even if you can have a sip of water, have that. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, there's barakah in eating suhoor, so do not leave it. Even if one is to drink a sip of water. Even if it's just a sip of water. And the people who eat suhoor, we learn in a hadith that Allah and His angels send mercy upon those people. When you're eating suhoor for the sake of Allah, Allah is sending His mercy on you and His angels are praying to Allah, Ya Allah, please bless the servant of yours because she is eating suhoor. He is eating suhoor. In another hadith we learn, the Prophet ﷺ said, How excellent are dates as the believer's suhoor. Meaning having dates, tamr, is actually something that is proven from the sunnah. Meaning if a person has it for suhoor, then that is best. So make sure to incorporate dates in your diet during the month of Ramadan, in suhoor as well as at the time of iftar. And when it comes to breaking the fast also, this is a very beautiful time because in a hadith we learn the fasting person has two occasions for joy one when he breaks his fast because of his breaking it and the other when he will meet his lord because of the reward for his fast because when you're breaking your fast there is you know that happiness that relief and that hope that inshallah you know the reward is complete because the fast is complete so inshallah one more fast has been added to my record inshallah so when a person breaks a fast, then there is joy for him because he finally gets to eat and drink. But remember that what will be more joyful than those samosas and pakoras is the reward that Allah has in store for you. Because, you know, when we're waiting for those moments to break the fast, finally hear that, that bell or that adhan, we're just staring at that food and we cannot wait to just eat it. And as we eat it, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every sip of water. Right? Because the mouth, like it's, it's parched, it's so dry, the throat, you, you're exhausted. And every sip of water, every bite of food, you're so grateful for it. You enjoy it like you haven't eaten before. You value that water as if you haven't had water before. You're happy about those dates as if you've never had those dates. Even if they're not that sweet, even if they're not that great, but still you will enjoy them. Now as you enjoy that iftar, remind yourself that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store is far better, is much more enjoyable than this food that I'm eating right now. So hope for that reward. In another hadith we learn the Prophet ﷺ about how he would break his fast. Would you like to know so that you can get more reward? Because remember that when a person follows the sunnah, then he gets more reward. The same action you could be doing without the sunnah, and you're doing it, you're getting it done. But if you do it while following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then you know what's going to happen? You're going to receive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Because in the Quran we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhibbkum Allah. If you love Allah, then follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you will follow him, Allah will love you. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was ala khuluqin azim. His manner, his character was the best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him what to do, how to do, when to do. So this is the reason why it's very essential that we pay attention to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
even when it comes to little things such as breaking the fast. So how is it that the Prophet ﷺ would break his fast? Would he break it with a crunchy samosa or with a fruit salad or something like that? We learn that the Prophet ﷺ would break his fast with fresh dates. With fresh dates. And if those fresh dates were not available, then he would eat dried dates. And if even that was not available, then he would just take a few sips of water. So first choice is fresh dates. What are fresh dates? Do you know what fresh dates are like? The ones which are crunchy, the yellow ones. Okay? The yellow ones, the ones that are crunchy, they're juicy. All right? Now, uh, I don't know if you can find them here. If you do, please do share with your friends so that inshallah they can also follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will notice that if you have that date, many people, they don't really enjoy it, but it's an acquired taste. All right? Uh, but once you start having it, you really begin to enjoy it. Because it's got water in it, it's got sugar in it, it's got flavor in it, right? And if that was not available, then dried dates. Dried dates are which ones? Are you familiar? The dates that we normally have, the brown ones. Not the super hard dry ones which you get at nikah ceremonies. The normal dates, okay? So those are the dried dates. So it's best to break your fast with dates, and if that's not possible, then at least water. And as we break our fast, also remember to help other people break their fast. You know, at the time of iftar, get that bowl of dates in your hand. Okay, keep it with yourself. So as soon as the time comes in to break your fast, you can be the one to pass those dates around so that inshallah you can get the reward. You can get added reward. Because in a hadith we learn, he who gives food for a fasting person to break his fast will receive the same reward as him. He will receive the same reward as him. So you're fasting, your husband's fasting. And if you serve him the dates, then inshallah you will get reward for two fasts on that one day. Inshallah. Alright? So, فَاسْتَبِقُ khairat, Hasten, rush in doing good deeds. And also remember to recite the dua of breaking the fast. We learn about the dua, ذَهَبَ الظَّمَأُ وَبْتَلَّتِ الْعُرُوقُ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ inshallah. And if somebody gives us something to break our fast with, then remember to make dua for them also. Now remember that the month of Ramadan is not just about fasting. It is not just about having the suhoor and having the iftar. Because for many people, and sadly it is us women, our Ramadan revolves around suhoor and iftar. Before we go to sleep, for the few hours of the night, we want to make sure that suhoor is ready. Right? And we have to wake up early to prepare suhoor for ourselves and the rest of the family. And for iftar also what happens is that most of the day goes in or a lot of the day goes in, you know, preparing the food, bringing the food and serving the food and then wrapping up. Remember that the month of Ramadan is a month of fasting, not feasting. Right? So the goal is not to enjoy food. The goal is to deprive the body of food so that we can focus on the spirit. Because this body, no matter how much we feed it, it is going to eventually go under the earth. It is going to decay, it is going to decompose, it's going to finish. But it's the ruh, it's the soul that matters a lot. It's the actions that we perform. It's the sincerity with which we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that matters. Because وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ الصَّالِحَةُ What will remain are actually good deeds. So this is why the focus of this month should not be just on eating and drinking at the two ends of the day. No. It should also be something else. And what is that? What is the main goal of fasting? That we earn Allah's forgiveness. We do something during the day and we do something during the night by which we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. And the reason why we are made to experience hunger and thirst is because when we're hungry, when we're thirsty, we feel needy. We feel desperate. When our stomach is full, our desires are satisfied, then we don't feel that we have any need of Allah. We forget about the things that we are doing, the actions that we're committing. We don't really give much importance to that because we're satisfied. There we're satisfied. So when we're made to experience hunger and thirst in Ramadan, 
through fasting, it is so that we can feel our neediness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we are faqir, we're so needy that our stomachs are empty. We're so needy that we're desperate for even a sip of water. We're so needy in the night prayer that we cannot wait to just sit down and relax our legs. We're so needy during this time that we cannot wait just except that we can just somehow manage to sleep for a few more hours. The body is deprived so that we can realize the fact that we are not independent of Allah. We need Him. We need Him. And this is why one of the main goals of this month should be to beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Beg Him for forgiveness. Strive to earn His forgiveness. The Prophet ﷺ said that one Ramadan expiates the sins till the next Ramadan, provided that one has avoided the major sins. Meaning, from one Ramadan to the other Ramadan. So for example, last Ramadan, and inshallah if we get to see this Ramadan, whatever mistakes that have happened during this time, Hopefully, inshallah, with this coming Ramadan, if we are able to fast and pray, then inshallah, the sins that were committed in this past year, inshallah, they'll be forgiven. Inshallah, they'll be forgiven. But this is for those who seek Allah's forgiveness. In the Quran, we learn that وَالصَّائِمِينَ وَالصَّائِمَاتِ The men who fast and the women who fast, وَالْحَافِظِينَ فُرُوجِهُمْ وَالْحَافِظَاتِ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ Maghfirah. Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. So fasting, the act of fasting itself brings forgiveness. But during Ramadan, when we're fasting, it is necessary that we beg Allah for forgiveness also. It is necessary that we seek forgiveness for the sins that we have committed. Because in a hadith we learn that once the Prophet ﷺ he was ascending the mimbal. He was going up on the mimbal. And as he ascended, he said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And the people, they were wondering, we didn't really hear anything. Why are you saying Ameen? So they asked him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel came to me. And he said, that whoever finds the month of Ramadan, and he is not able to get his sins forgiven, then may he be distanced from Allah. Meaning, if a person finds the month of Ramadan, and he does not manage to get his sins forgiven, he does not make himself worthy of Allah's forgiveness, then there is no chance for this person. If he cannot take advantage of Ramadan, then when? When will he change? When will he ask Allah for forgiveness? If in this time of the year when the gates of paradise are opened up, shayateen are locked up, there is an entire atmosphere of worship. If a person does not manage to get himself forgiven, then when will he get himself forgiven? So it is very essential that we strive to seek Allah's forgiveness through various ways in this month. One of those ways is fasting. Another is making dua. Ask Allah to forgive you. Say during the day, Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulli dhambin wa atubu ilayhi. Ya Allah, I cannot even count the number of sins that I've committed. I don't even remember what I've done. I don't even realize my sins. I don't even realize my mistakes. You know. You know them better than me. Ya Allah, forgive me for my sins, which are preventing me from so much khair. Ya Allah, clean me, cleanse me. Because you know, our sins, they create hurdles for us. They don't let us progress. They don't let us go forward. They chain us, they bind us. So it's very important that we seek Allah's forgiveness at this time. Also we learn that at the time of suhoor, when you're up anyway, when it's so easy to wake up these days, you know, in the month of Ramadan, especially because you know that if you don't get up, you won't be able to eat, and if you don't eat, you know, may Allah protect you. Right? Because the fasts are long, so you better put something in your stomach. So you're up anyway to have that suhoor. And as women, sometimes we have to spend extra time. While our husbands and our children are getting an extra half an hour of sleep, here we are standing in the kitchen, in front of the stove, feeling pity for ourselves. But at that time, as you're preparing the food, do istighfar. In the Qur'an, we learn about the people of Jannah. وَبِلْ أَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ At the time of suhoor, they used to seek forgiveness from Allah. 
while others were sleeping, they would beg Allah to forgive them. Ask Allah to forgive you. And as you see that fire on the stove, remind yourself of the fire of hell. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And in a hadith that you all are very familiar with, in which we learn that when half of the night or two-thirds of the night is over, at the time of suhoor basically, the last part of the night, Allah, the blessed and exalted, descends to the lowest heaven. He comes very close to His servants. Very close to His servants. And He says, Is there anyone who needs something? Who wants to ask for something so that I can give him? Is there anyone who wants something so that I can give him? Is there anyone who asks my forgiveness so that I may forgive him? Is there anyone who wants forgiveness from me so that I can forgive him? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps asking, is there anyone who has some dua? Is there anyone who needs something? Is there anyone who wants forgiveness? Ask and I will give you. And he keeps saying that until it is the time of Fajr. Until it is daybreak. So as you are preparing that food, as you are eating that food, don't just eat silently. And even if you're quiet in your mouth, you know, in your head, in your heart, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Make use of that time. Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many hadiths we learn about various adhkar, which if we read, for example, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير A hundred times. Likewise, subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. A hundred times. So many adhkar. Which if a person reads a hundred times a day, then what happens? His sins are forgiven. Even if his sins are as much as the foam, which is on sea. You know like the water waves when they come? There's so many bubbles that they leave behind. The scum, the foam. Imagine if your sins are that many. And there are. If we truly ask ourselves, we do have many sins. But if a person remembers Allah through the day, while he's fasting, then inshallah there is forgiveness for him. The Prophet ﷺ used to say, أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْحَيِّ الْقَيُّومِ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ In his sajda, he would seek forgiveness. In his rukur, he would seek forgiveness. When we're standing in nawafil, we're praying nawafil, extra voluntary prayers in the month of Ramadan. The focus should not just be on finishing the Qur'an in taraweeh or in qiyam. The focus should be to earn Allah's forgiveness. So as you stand in Qiyam, when you go down to Rukur, ask Allah for forgiveness. When you go down into Sajda, ask Allah for forgiveness. Then the month of Ramadan is a month of fasting. It is a time to seek forgiveness. But it is also a month that teaches us Taqwa. That teaches us God consciousness. That teaches us to be more alert, more careful. Because what happens is that Certain things, certain actions, certain words, certain behaviors, certain reactions, we know they're not right. We know that if our child makes a mistake, we shouldn't just snap at him. We shouldn't start yelling at him. We know that if our husband walks in through the door 10 minutes late than expected, we know that we shouldn't be angry at him at that time. Just give him you know, a chance, take it easy, give him a break for God's sake. But we become very difficult in dealing with people. We become very impatient in dealing with people. Right? Likewise, certain words that we shouldn't be using. But bad habits. Ramadan is a time that helps us break our bad habits. How many of you are in the habit of having tea regularly? MashaAllah, there are many people. For many women... There has to be a cup of tea in the morning and a cup of tea at 12 o'clock and a cup of tea in the evening, right? And maybe more than that or less than that. For some people, it's not tea, it's coffee. Whatever it may be, it's a habit. And if you miss your tea one day, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on your family, right? Because we're so used to it, we start depending on these habits. But what happens in the month of Ramadan? Where does your tea go? When do you have it? At the time of suhoor, even if you want to have it, you tell yourself, if I have it, I'll be awake. I actually want to catch up on some sleep. So maybe I'll skip. But other people, they're like, no, I cannot leave my tea. When do you have your tea then? Maybe a cup at suhoor, 
maybe a cup at iftar, maybe a cup in the middle. But your habit of 12 o'clock tea break, it goes away. For 30 days, you're not having tea at that time. We have a habit of snacking, you know, of eating. But what happens in the month of Ramadan? You reach out for food, like, no, no, I'm fasting. You ha- have a cup of water before you and you say, no, no, I'm fasting. You're preparing food and you have a habit of munching on things as you prepare. You tell him, no, no, I'm fasting. You're feeding your child and he's not finishing his food. So you say, let me just finish it. You're like, no, no, I'm fasting. All those habits, you know, of eating, of drinking, what happens? You are able to break them. Isn't it? Ramadan teaches you that you're stronger. You're stronger than your desires. You're stronger than your excuses. You're much stronger than you think you are. If you can resist the urge to eat and drink for over 12 hours, then you can also resist the urge to give someone a piece of your mind. You can also control your tongue when it's going to unleash, right? You also have the strength to replace bad words with good words. You have that in you. So Ramadan, fasting, it teaches us taqwa. In the Quran, Allah tells us, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The reason behind making fasting an obligation on the Muslim Ummah is so that they can develop taqwa. They can develop God consciousness. And this taqwa is so essential. It is so important because if a person does not have fear of God, then, you know, like in, in a hadith, we learned that if you don't have shyness, then go do whatever you want. فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ If you don't have haya for of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then فَاصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتَ Then go ahead and commit any sin you want because you don't have any shyness. You don't have any fear of God. So this fear of God is very important to protect us from sins, to watch our tongue, to watch our expressions even, to be careful about our reactions, our dealings with people. So this month is a month of training. It is a month of training. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And this training, are we in need of it? Are we in need of it? Because, you know, sometimes people ask us, or we may even think, what's the point of fasting? 30 days in a row, what's the benefit? Health benefits? I don't think so. My sleep schedule is upside down. I'm struggling through the day. I'm just waiting for the month to end. You know why? Because we're not really reaping the benefits of this month. The objective of this month is not to starve us. The purpose of this month is not to make us hungry and thirsty. That's not the purpose. That's not the objective. The purpose is something much more. And that is some training to resist your urges, to have a better control over yourself, over your body, over your actions, over your emotions. And this is the reason why We learn from hadith that where it is necessary to protect our mouths from food and drink, it is also necessary to watch what we say. Because if a person is not watching his words, is not watching his behavior with others, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need of his staying hungry and thirsty. Allah has no need of that. In a hadith we learn that fasting is not just abstaining from eating and drinking, but fasting is also refraining from vain speech, from useless talk and foul language, and sexual actions. If one of you is being verbally abused or annoyed, he should say, I am fasting. Meaning, even if someone's provoking you, if someone else is provoking you, they're saying nasty things to you, and you're getting really upset and really angry, and you want to say something. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ say, I am fasting. The scholar said, that who should the person say this to? I am fasting. Do you know who, who he should say this to? To the other person, right? Who's provoking him, but not just the other person. Also to yourself. Remind yourself, I am fasting. I am fasting. It does not befit a person who is keeping away from food and drink for the sake of Allah, that he goes on yelling and abusing people with his words. Yelling at people. No, it does not befit him. So remind yourself, I am fasting. Because... If we don't do that, then what's the point of staying hungry and thirsty? The Prophet ﷺ said, Some fasting people get nothing from their fast except for hunger. And some people who pray at night get nothing from their standing except sleeplessness.
So many people who fast during the day, but what do they get at the end? Just hunger. Just hunger and thirst. And there's so many people who stay awake at night praying, but what do they get? Just staying awake at night. They didn't really benefit from their fast. They didn't really benefit from their qiyam. Another hadith tells us that whoever does not give up lying and forge speech, meaning lying, and evil actions, then Allah is not in need of his leaving his food and drink. Allah does not need you to stay hungry and thirsty. You better watch your fast in other ways also. So Ramadan, fasting, it teaches us taqwa. It teaches us to be more conscious. So as you are more conscious of your eating, your drinking, your sleep, then be more conscious about being patient. Show more patience. Try that your fast is not only about staying hungry and thirsty, but also observe the fast of the eyes. Pay attention to what you're looking at. Pay attention to what you're thinking about. Pay attention to what you're listening to. Pay attention to what you're saying. Pay attention to what you're doing with your hands. Because sometimes the same hands that we, you know, caress our children with, we hug them and we, you know, show them our love, the same hands we use to abuse them also. Even if it's just a light slap at the back or something like that. Be careful. Be extra careful where the feet are taking you. What the hands are writing. Because sometimes we don't abuse with words. We abuse out with what we type. So it's necessary to pay attention to that also. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you taqwa. One of the du'as that we must strive to make throughout this month is the du'a of taqwa. Ya Allah, give me taqwa. Grant me taqwa. Grant me more consciousness of you. Allahumma ati nafsi taqwaha. Oh Allah, give my nafs its taqwa, its piety, its consciousness that it desperately needs. Ramadan, the month of fasting also teaches us patience. It also teaches us sabr. What is sabr? Sabr is basically to control yourself. Habsun nafs. It is to control yourself. It is when you have the urge to do something, but you tell yourself, no, I'm not going to do it. To have that composure. And it's of three kinds. Sabr is of three kinds. One is at the time of adversity, at the time of difficulty, that when a person has suffered from a loss, or, or he's suffering from some pain or some kind of difficulty, then at that time, being patient, meaning accepting Allah's decree, and not saying anything that would be inappropriate, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be displeased with. That is one kind of patience. Another kind of patience is to become patient on good deeds, meaning to become firm on obedience. Because you really have to sometimes force yourself to get up and drive to the masjid, especially at night for taraweeh. And you really have to force yourself to stand up from the back of the masjid and go and stand in the rows in salah. You really have to force yourself. You're going against your desires. Your body wants to rest, but you push it to wake up. You want to lie down and take a nap, but you force yourself. No, just a few days, recite some Qur'an. You want to just sit down and maybe watch something and take it easy, give yourself a break. But you force yourself, you push yourself to open up the Qur'an instead, to listen to something good instead. So in this month, we are basically training ourselves to develop more patience. The third type of patience is keeping away from sins. Because again, when sin is before us, the opportunity is before us, and there's that urge also, then what do you need? A lot of willpower to stop yourself. You need a lot of willpower to stop yourself from sinning, especially when you have the ability and the opportunity. So in Ramadan, what happens? The food is in front of you. You know how thirsty you are. You know exactly how it's going to taste and how it's going to feel when you put it in your mouth. But even if somebody gives you $20, you're not going to eat it. Even if somebody says, you know what, I'll treat you to something. I'll buy you something. You're not going to eat it. It's made easy for you to disobey Allah. But you're not going to do it because you're fasting. You know sometimes little children, they don't understand why their mom is not eating. So what happens? As they're eating, they put food in their mother's mouths. They try to. But mama, you also eat. But what happens? Somebody is trying to put food in your mouth. Your child. 
Your child is trying to put food in your mouth. Would you say, no, 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 mama's fasting. I cannot eat. And they look at you in confusion that what's going on? Why won't you eat? But what happens? You manage to stop yourself. You have a better control over yourself. So Ramadan proves to us that if you can keep away from eating and drinking, even though you're thirsty and hungry, you desperately want that food, then you are also able to remain patient. You can also stop yourself from sin. You can also push yourself. You can also force yourself to do that extra good that you've been ignoring and delaying and procrastinating for so long. It shows us, it proves to us that we can, we can push ourselves forward. The Prophet ﷺ described the month of Ramadan as Shahru Sabr. Shahru Sabr. In a hadith we learn that fasting the month of patience, meaning fasting in the month of Ramadan, and the fasts of three days each month, they remove rancor from the heart. They clean the heart of a person. They help a person get rid of grudges. Then the heart is clean. Fasting in the month of Ramadan, the month of patience. Because if you think about it, what is it that doesn't allow us to forgive others? It's impatience, right? We cannot tolerate what other people are doing. We don't want to accept the injustice that they're doing against us. We don't want to accept it. That's our impatience. We want things to happen the way we want them, the way we desire. But things happen otherwise. So we get angry, we get upset, we hold grudges in our heart against Allah and also against Allah's servants. But fasting in the month of Ramadan, it helps you clean your heart. In the Quran we learn, وَجَزَاهُمْ بِمَا صَبَرُوا جَنَّةً وَحَرِيرًا And their reward because of their patience will be jannah and silk. Fine silk. Meaning the people who observe patience in this world, in this life, whether it's patience in the month of Ramadan or outside of that, but especially in the month of Ramadan because it's difficult to be patient when you're hungry and thirsty and sleep deprived. But remember the reward of patience. Allah will give Jannah for sabr. Allah will give harir. He will give silk, comfort, luxury for your sabr. The month of Ramadan is also the month of Qur'an. We think that the month of Ramadan is important because we're supposed to fast in it. But you know something? Fasting was made obligatory in the second year after Hijrah. When the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, as a Prophet, he was there for 13 years. After that, he did Hijrah to Medina. Not the first year, but the second year, the Muslims were told to fast in the month of Ramadan. But remember that the month of Ramadan was special even before fasting was prescribed. The month of Ramadan is special even if a person is not able to fast. Because some people, for some genuine reason, they're not able to fast in the month of Ramadan. And they're excused by the Sharia to not fast. Whether it is extreme old age, or it is some health concerns, whatever it may be, but a person is not able to fast. So he thinks, oh, Ramadan, I, I don't really feel Ramadan because I don't fast in the month of Ramadan. So it doesn't really matter to me much. No. Remember, Ramadan is important even if you're not fasting. Even if you're not fasting, still Ramadan is special. Why? Because what makes Ramadan special is not fasting. It is something else. Does anyone know what that is? It is the fact that the Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan. Ramadan is the only month that is mentioned in the Qur'an. Shahru Ramadan. And how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention it? That Shahru Ramadan, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ Quran. It is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. The month of Qur'an. And this is the reason why we see that the Prophet ﷺ would review the entire Qur'an in the month of Ramadan with his Qur'an partner. And who was that? The angel Jibreel. And how would he review it? He would listen to Jibreel recite the Qur'an to him. And then the Prophet ﷺ would recite the Qur'an back to Jibreel. He would listen to the Qur'an and he would also recite it. Because both of these actions, listening as well as recitation, both of them are distinct acts of worship. 
They're two different acts of worship. If you're listening to the Qur'an, you're actually worshiping Allah. If you're reciting the Qur'an, again you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there's a lot of excellence of listening to the Qur'an also. In Surah Al-Anfal, for example, we learn, وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا That the believers, when the verses of Allah, when the Qur'an is recited to them, it increases them in iman. It increases them in faith. And this is how the Qur'an is reviewed, by listening as well as by reading. So set a goal for yourself, that at least once review the Qur'an, recite the whole Qur'an, at least once. And it might seem like a big daunting task, but if you divide it over the day, that with every salah, after every salah, before every salah, whatever is easy for you, you know, read for example four pages. Five pages, whatever is easy for you. And hopefully, inshallah, by the end of the day, you'll manage to read the entire juz. And if you dedicate a juz a day, then inshallah, hopefully, you will complete the entire Qur'an. But then what happens? When women, they get their time of the month. They were on schedule, every day a juz, every day a juz. And their time of the month comes, and then they fall seven juz behind. They fall five juz behind. They fall eight juz behind, whatever it may be. And then they're like, you know what, I give up. I don't know when I'm going to be able to complete the entire Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. Then remember that first of all, if you cannot read it, certainly, certainly you can listen to it. Certainly you can listen to it. And if you're listening to it, that in itself is an act of worship. So if you're not able to recite the Qur'an, listen. Some people, they find it difficult to recite the Qur'an. They don't have much reading fluency. Or they get more tired because... They're trying to get their ha and their ayn and everything right, so their mouth is tired. And when they realize that they've spent half an hour reading only two pages, then they're like, oh, it's going to take me so long. So again, don't get disheartened. Spend some time reading the Qur'an, but also listen to it. And remind yourself, listening to the Qur'an is also an act of worship. And you know what the best thing is? If during the day you recite the Qur'an yourself, and during the night, you listen to it in tarawih. That's ideal. Ideal. But for many women, again, it's not possible for them to go for tarawih. Especially this Ramadan, when the nights are so short, and tarawih is going to be so late, many women must be wondering from now, there goes my Ramadan. I don't know how I'm going to do it. If you cannot go to the masjid yourself, again, you can listen to the Qur'an through the day. Read it and also listen to the Qur'an through the day. And have your children listen to it also. And you know what? The Prophet ﷺ had a Qur'an partner. Jibreel would listen and he would recite to him. Find someone whom you can recite the Qur'an to. And whose Qur'an you can listen to. Maybe it's your sibling. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your son. Maybe it's your daughter. Maybe it's your friend. Maybe it's your neighbor. What a good thing to sit together for. Listen to one another. Ideal. It's best. You get both benefits. And you see, when a person fasts in the month of Ramadan, then what happens? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ You develop taqwa. And in this month, you don't just fast, you also revive your connection with the Qur'an. You strengthen it. The book that you read, that you studied, that you recited, maybe it's been a while that you recited it. Now revisit this book again. Recite it again. Listen to it again. Listen to it in the car. Listen to it at home. Listen to it while you're preparing food. Listen to it. Spend more and more time listening to it, reciting it. When you will do that, you will strengthen your connection with the Qur'an. And you know who benefits from the Qur'an? The people who have taqwa. Because ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا للمتقين. It is a guide for who? For those people who have taqwa. So this month is a month of training in which we develop taqwa, God consciousness. Why? So that we can benefit more from the Qur'an. This is why fast during the day and recite the Qur'an in the night also. In a hadith we learn that the fast and the Qur'an are two intercessors for the servant of Allah on the day of resurrection. The fast will come and say, O oh Lord, I prevented him from food and desires during the day. Let me intercede for him. And the Qur'an will say, I prevented him from sleeping at night. 
Let me intercede for him, and their intercession will be accepted. Has it ever happened with you that you're stuck somewhere and someone comes and advocates for you? Or says something in your favor and that kind of saves you? And then later on you're thanking him, thank you so much for saying that one statement, even it saved me. I don't know how I can thank you. I'm so grateful to you. When you desperately need support from someone and somebody supports you through just a word or two, imagine on the day of judgment how desperate we will be for forgiveness. And what will come? Quran. What will come? The fasting. Likewise, we learn that when we pay attention to you know, uh, revive our connection with the Quran, we are going to spend time reciting it, listening to it, but also do review its meanings. Because for many of us, there is a barrier between us and the Quran. And what is that? A, a language barrier. It's in a different language than ours. Or we have studied the Quranic meanings, but it's been a while. Maybe we studied them, let's say, a year ago, or two years ago, five years ago. And there are portions of the Qur'an that, whose meanings we have kind of forgotten. So it's a good time to review the meanings also. It's a good time to review the meanings also. So read the translation. Listen to some you know, lecture. Or attend a gathering in which people are reviewing the meaning of the Qur'an. Just the translation. But refresh that meaning so that you can enjoy a recitation and enjoy your qiyam also. The month of Ramadan is also a month of du'as. As you heard the ayat earlier about the month of Ramadan, the last ayah was about du'a. That, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيمٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَ الْهَدَّارِ إِذَا دَعَانِ Allah responds to the call of the caller when he calls upon him. So make du'a also in this month. In a hadith we learn that du'a made by three people are not rejected. Du'as made by three people are not rejected. Who are those three people? The father. So make sure you tell your husbands to make du'as for your children. Secondly, the fasting person. And thirdly, the traveler. This is a hadith that is reported by Al-Bayhiqi. So who are these three? The father, the fasting person, and the traveler. So when you're fasting this month, take advantage of that. Allah is paying special attention to your du'as. Why not ask for whatever you need? Whatever you need. You know, the first victory, the victory of Badr. You know when that was? In which month? In the month of Ramadan. The conquest of Makkah. You know when that was? In the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted victory to His Messenger in this month. So this is a time when we also have victories. And we cannot have any kind of victory, any kind of success, whether it is overcoming something you know, some bad habit or whatever it may be. We cannot overcome anything except with Allah's help. So make dua. And especially at the time of breaking your fast, make dua. Because when a person is breaking his fast, he's completing a good deed, then that is the time to make dua. Because that dua, inshallah, will not be refused. A fasting person, a hadith tells us, a fasting person upon breaking his fast has a supplication that will not be rejected. But unfortunately for many women, that time is spent in what? Last minute things to put at the table, last minute things to do to serve the table, serve the guests, and we waste those precious moments. Precious moments. Get everything ready just 10 minutes ahead. 10 minutes ahead. Get everything ready. And so what if the table is not looking perfect? Doesn't matter. Make dua at that time. And let's say you are in a desperate situation where even the food is not ready. Then I mean, you have to kind of you know, prepare the food. Because it's not fair for your family that they're sitting while you're making dua. They're sitting hungry and you're making dua. So as you're preparing, as you're working, keep your tongue moist. And keep making dua to Allah. Take advantage of this great opportunity. And it's the time to remember Allah. In a hadith we learned that once a person came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I know that many commandments of Islam are upon me. Meaning, I know that there's so many things I have to do. But just tell me one thing that I may practice consistently throughout my life. Consistently throughout my life, what is it that I should really focus on? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. Keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. Constantly engage in the remembrance of Allah. And through Ramadan, while you're fasting, 
Keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. If a person says, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa mulku wa lahu alhamdu wa ala kulli shayin qadir a hundred times in one day, then he will get the reward of freeing ten slaves. Are there any slaves these days that you can buy and you know set free? You can't. You don't have that opportunity. But if you say this a hundred times, you will get the reward of freeing ten slaves. A hundred good deeds will be written for him. And a hundred sins will be erased from him. A hundred sins will be erased. For who? For the one who says this dhikr a hundred times a day. And you know what? You can fix this dhikr with a certain chore that you have to do. So for example, after suhoot, everybody's gonna go pray their salah and go to sleep. But what do you have to do? Stay in the kitchen and wrap up the food and clean up the kitchen and you tell yourself, you know what, I might as well do all the cleaning up right now so that for the whole day I wouldn't need to worry. So as you're doing that, keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. As you're preparing food, keep your tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah. Likewise, this month is a month of compassion. When we, when we feel hunger and thirst, then we feel other people's pain also. We can empathize with them. We can experience what they experience. So this is a time to remember others also, especially those people who are needy in society. Whether it is our family members, or it is the poor and needy in some other country, or the poor and needy in our own country, in our own city. Someone who's sick. Someone who needs help. This is a time to really excel in good deeds and help others also who are needy. And there are so many opportunities which, alhamdulillah, we are informed of in this month. Local food banks, or for example, ration programs where you can send food abroad for people in need. You can donate clothing. Alhamdulillah, at Al-Huda and Mississauga, we're actually having a toy drive in which you can donate brand new toys, not even lightly used, just brand new, like literally packaged, fresh from the store. You can donate them for children, for Muslim families who will get those gifts at Reed. Because those families cannot afford much for their children. And alhamdulillah, we did this last year also. And so many children were given these uh, gifts that there was a little girl, she was shocked. She was literally shocked that that gift was for her. Because she had never received anything like that before. She could never imagine. Can you imagine being in that situation where you cannot buy a gift for your child? You cannot buy a gift for your child. You find out that your son really, really likes you know those uh, Beyblades or your daughter really likes some kind of a doll or something but you realize that you can't afford it you're either going to get groceries for them give them milk so that their bones can be strong or you can buy them a Beyblade and obviously what are you going to prefer? food imagine being in that situation so remember other people also we become really extravagant in the month of Ramadan where we spend a lot of money on our food on entertainment, having people over, giving gifts to one another, at a, but we forget other people. But this month teaches us compassion. You're hungry, you're thirsty, think about people who are not hungry and thirsty voluntarily. They're hungry and thirsty by force. They don't have a choice. So remember them and alleviate their difficulties so that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove difficulties from you. So take advantage of these opportunities which come our way. And this is a time of giving sadaqah. And we see that the Prophet ﷺ used to give so much sadaqah in the month of Ramadan that his giving sadaqah is described as fast wind. He was more generous in the fast wind. You know when wind blows, then it affects everything. It affects everything. You know from the rooftops to the trees to little plants. I mean recently in the past week, we saw those really windy days. At least in Mississauga we saw them. And I noticed that in my backyard there were these certain plants which were very, very small at that time. And I noticed that one of them was completely bent. Our neighbors, a part of their tree had broken off. Literally, it had broken off because of that fast wind. It affects everything. The Prophet ﷺ, he was more generous than the fast wind. Meaning, he would give sadaqah everywhere. Everywhere. Any opportunity that he would find. Every opportunity that he would find, he would give, he would give in charity. In a hadith we learn that the rich ones, the people who are rich, 
the people who have many blessings, they will be poor on the Day of Judgment. Except for those who spend here and there and like this and like that. Me, the Prophet ﷺ really exaggerated that they give a lot of sadaqah. They spend a lot in the way of Allah. So this is a time of protecting ourselves from hellfire, of securing for ourselves shade on the Day of Judgment because a person will be under the shade of his sadaqah on the Day of Judgment. So this is the time to do that. Give sadaqah this month. Think about it from now. How much sadaqah you're going to give? And give more than that. You know, recently I was at a gathering where somebody was telling other people about the different ways in which they can give sadaqah this month. Basically different opportunities that are coming up. And this lady was sitting next to me and immediately she pulled out some money and she said, can you please give it to the sister so that she can spend it in whatever cause she finds best? I was amazed that speech was not even over. That announcement was not even over. And this woman had already spent. She was already giving sadaqah. But sometimes what happens is that we hold back. We think if I give money, if I give my savings, then what will I have left? How am I going to eventually buy that house that I really want? And how am I eventually going to buy that car that I really want? No. Who is our provider? Not our bank account. Not our paycheck. Our provider is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a hadith Qudsi, we learned, O son of Adam, spend and you will be spent on. You give and Allah will give you. You give and Allah will give you. So give in this month so that you can receive more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if there is any zakat that is due, then first and foremost give the zakat. And if alhamdulillah that is taken care of, then after that, pay attention to more sadaqah also. After that, also remember that this is a time of qiyam. The month of Ramadan is a time when we should really pay a lot of attention to standing in prayer because whoever spends their Ramadan fasting during the day and standing in Qiyam at night, then of course we learn from hadith that his fast sins will be forgiven. In the Quran we learn about the people of Jannah that they used to sleep little in the night. كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ And this Ramadan as you will experience that, literally you are saying to yourself, how much sleep did I manage to get this night? Two hours? One hour? Three hours? What happened? Where did my sleep go? Don't feel pity for yourself. That, you know, give yourself a pat. Alhamdulillah. Finally, I can be of those people who sleep little at night. I'll make it up during the day. Hopefully, I will be amongst the people who slept little in the night so that they could relax in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best prayer after the prescribed prayer is the prayer at night. The best prayer after the fourth prayer is the night prayer. Qiyamun Layl. So if you're able, go for Taraweeh. Because when you're praying together, it becomes easier. But if that is not a possibility, due to your schedule or due to your family situation, then don't deprive yourself completely. Pray nuffle at home. The Prophet ﷺ, his habit was to pray eight raka'ah, nuffle at night, and finishing that off with three witr. Every night this was his habit, in Ramadan and also outside of Ramadan. So make sure that you pray at least eight rakah. Even if you cannot recite, you know, a whole juz. Recite as much as you can. But do some kind of qiyamul layl. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability to go for umrah, then go with that hope of reward that umrah in the month of Ramadan is like doing hajj with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because... Any good deed that is performed in this month, its reward is multiplied. And take advantage of the last 10 days of Ramadan. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he would strive during the last 10 days of Ramadan more than he would do so at any other time. Aisha anha described that with the beginning of the last 10 days, the Prophet ﷺ would tighten his waist belt. You know like if you're ready to do something and give it your best, what do you do? You gather your clothes up together. You're like, I'm, I'm all set for it. I'm all ready for it. You pin your hijab, you tie your dubatta or whatever it is so that your clothes don't become a hindrance for you. So the Prophet ﷺ, he would also strive his best in the last 10 days. And he would also wake his family up during the night. Why? So that they could also find Laylatul Qadr. Because Laylatul Qadr khayram min al it is better than a thousand months. If a person manages to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that night, imagine, 
It is as though he's been worshipping Allah for a thousand months. Which of us has that ability? Which of us is going to actually live for that long? We don't even know. So this is once a year opportunity which a person must not deprive himself from because if he does so, then he is depriving himself of a lot of good. He is depriving himself of a lot of good. And it is necessary that we engage in ibadah in this night because unfortunately for some people it's going to the masjid and having their coffee and tea and you know socializing. No, these are not nights of socializing. These are nights of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and earning His forgiveness. Aisha Abdullah anha, she asked that, Ya Rasulullah, if I find Laylatul Qadr, what should I do? What should I say? And she was told to make dua. What is that dua? Allahumma innaka afubun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu'anni. That, oh Allah, you are ever pardoning, you love to pardon, so please forgive me. All of these du'as, all of these virtues that I, that I shared with you today, all of these ahadith, you can actually find them in a book, Shahru Ramadan, which is available in Urdu as well as English. And alhamdulillah, the sisters have them over here. So if you'd like to remind yourself of anything, increase in your awareness of any of these aspects, or share with your family and friends of any of these virtues, please do take advantage of this book, inshallah. And there is also a checklist that's available. A checklist that inshallah will remind you of having dates for suhoor, having dates for iftar, of you know reciting certain adhkar through the day. So inshallah, this checklist will be a source of motivation for you and your family to make sure that you are performing certain deeds and you know make the most of this Ramadan. Because you see, Ramadan is a very unique opportunity. Everyone doesn't get it. There are many people who died yesterday. And there are many people who died today because every single day people die. Some people die old, some people die young, some people die at, in a state where they're expecting death to approach them and some people die unexpectedly. The other day this lady came up to me and she told me that her mother died one day before Ramadan. Last year, or one of the previous years, her mother died one day before Ramadan. So we don't know whether this Ramadan, we are going to actually see it or not. So make the intention from now. Because when a person makes the intention to do something good, then a good deed is already recorded for him. So make the intention from now. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that month to see, then make the most of it. Make the most of it. Because what if we don't get to see next Ramadan? What if we don't live to see next Ramadan? Because in Ramadan is Laylatul Qadr. And Laylatul Qadr, one of the meanings is that it is the night of decree. When the decrees of Allah's servants are handed over to the angels that go and do this for my servant. So we don't know what was decreed for us last Ramadan. If the angel of death was given the list of people whom he was, whom, whose souls he was supposed to collect, we don't know if our name was in that list. And we don't know, perhaps our name will be on that list this Ramadan. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an opportunity, let's make the most of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really give us the ability to make the most of this Ramadan, every day of it, every night of it, every moment of it. May these fasts really develop in us a stronger sense of taqwa. And may we develop more patience. And may these fasts and this recitation of Qur'an and the standing in prayer at night be a source of our forgiveness. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.